Uh, I, it's been a while since I've been called a young birder, so I definitely appreciate that. It's a good thing. <laughs> you don't have high def, so you can see all this gray in my beard. But um, you, you, it's, I, you're right. I, I, one of the things I love about living here in North Carolina is the easy access to the, the Gulf Stream, the, uh, the ocean, the pelagic birding. North Carolina is well known for being one of the, one of the pelagic birding hotspots in North America for good reason. And uh, I'm excited to talk to you about that tonight. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, bear with me as I get this set up. And all right, is that working for everybody? All right, yes. super. So um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, you know, what it's like to be out there, why this part of the world is such a unique and, and such a unique place for pelagic birds. Um, what and some of the natural history, some of the cool stories about some of the birds that you can find out there. Because one of the things that's it's really amazing about tube noses in general, and specifically in, in just pelagic birds in general, is that they all have these wonderful stories about um, you know how they can live in such an inhospitable place. And um, we'll we'll talk a little bit about that too. So birding the blue desert. Oh, it's not switching. Hold on. There you go. All right, so when we talk about pelagic birds, a lot of what we're talking about are birds like this, uh, tube noses, tropic birds, petrels, shearwaters, and uh, storm petrels are sort of the big, the big four. Um, and uh, those birds can be found just about everywhere, but we have this kind of unique suite of birds here in North Carolina that I'm going to kind of focus on. And if you ever make it down here to North, to North Carolina, please let me know, and uh, maybe we'll, we'll have to twist my arm to get me out on a boat and looking at some of these things. Uh, we'll start a little bit first about um, what the Gulf Stream is and why the Gulf Stream is important. So the Gulf Stream is one of many, many currents that, that move around in the ocean. And one of the things about the ocean that makes it it's, it's so amazing is that if you look out on there and you're not necessarily a practiced observer, you would think that the entire open ocean is uh, very much the same sort of habitat, but that's not true at all. Um, there's a lot of uh, diversity, even though you might not see it on the on the surface. Uh, but the Gulf Stream is one of the most important uh, currents in the North Atlantic. You can see it there off the east coast of, of North America there. It's part of this sort of North Atlantic gyre, um, this cycle that goes around. The, the warm water rises up as warm air rises. Warm water does the same. So the, so the warm Gulf Stream water comes out of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, where it's about 80 degrees a lot of times surface temperature most of the year. Uh, rises up to the top and flows northward up along the eastern seaboard up into the North Atlantic and then it turns back down and as it cools it sinks it hits that uh, the melting ice from Greenland it goes up into the Arctic and it, it cools down and then it sinks down and it goes uh, underneath underneath all the warm water all the way back around to the Gulf of Mexico and it starts to cycle again so it's this big uh, conveyor belt of organisms of energy of, um, of, of warm water, of water that kind of goes around the North Atlantic. So, and the Gulf Stream is massive. A lot of people don't necessarily realize it. It's one of, it's, it's, it's the water that passes the cubic, cube, in terms of cubic meat, it, cubic, bleh, in terms of cubic um, size is something along the lines of, it's larger than the water that is moving is, is there's more water, <laughs> excuse me, I got to work myself into this. <laughs> the water that is moving, there's more water moving than in all of the freshwater rivers together. It's approximately 40 feet wide, several feet, several hundred feet deep. And it's this massive river, essentially, in the middle of the ocean that's moving northward. You can see it right here. Um, so there's a couple other things going on that make the Gulf Stream in particular and this area off of North Carolina uh, very special. And you can see here uh, in this map that shows uh, surface water temperature on the left. Uh, that big red current that's running up northward, that is the Gulf Stream. But there's also this cold water that kind of sneaks down the eastern seaboard and meets at a point right off of Hatteras, North Carolina, right off the uh, Outer Banks of North Carolina. And this is, uh, so when this cold water rubs up against this warm water, then you get a lot of kind of turbulence and that causes a lot of energy transfer and a lot of, uh, of you know, the little organisms that live in the water kind of get moved around a lot. It's, it's a very turbulent part of the part of the ocean. And so that's really important when you're talking about birds that are looking for food that they can eat. 
Another thing that's really important is the uh, geographical. So you can see on this other map on the right, uh, that's the continental shelf. And the continental shelf drops off. It drops off from about 900 feet to 2,400 feet um, right off the coast of North Carolina. And uh, the closest point that the continental shelf reaches North Carolina or, or the North American continent is North Carolina, which is what makes Hatteras such a great hotspot because when this water reaches the continental shelf, it's like a big cliff and it hits the cliff and it forces it up. So this is another way in which the water and all the organisms that are living in the water, all the little phytoplankton and zooplankton and all that stuff get forced up towards the surface uh, and therefore makes it a little bit of an oasis in the middle of this blue desert of uh, the North Atlantic. So all these birds are kind of coming to this place to take advantage of this really kind of special place in terms of water temperature and geography. And it makes it very convenient for birders as well, because in a lot of places, if you go out on a pelagic trip off the East Coast, it takes you know, a very long time to get to the shelf break, which is what we call that, that cliff. And that's where a lot of the water organisms are, not just uh, pelagic bird species, but also cetaceans, fish, that's where people go fishing for swordfish and marlin and things of that nature as well. All this, all this stuff is happening in this one place. And in North Carolina, we're fortunate that it's only about 40 miles offshore. So you can get in a boat and you can motor out for a couple hours and suddenly you are in this, in this place. And when you get there, you can tell things are changing. So this is a picture of the Gulf Stream where it is pretty close to the Hatteras. You can see Hatteras Lighthouse there in the background. And um, the cold water is that kind of gray green water and the hot, you know, 75 degree plus water of the Gulf Stream is that rich, rich blue water. And you can actually see this break, this difference when you get out there. And that line where this cold water and this warm water meets, that's where a lot of things are happening. Um, so you can, and, and it moves too. So it's moving around. So the Gulf Stream isn't just set in a riverbank like the Mississippi River. It's kind of meandering back and forth with a difference between 10, 20 miles either way. And so what we will do when we go out here is that we will take a look at the surface temperature maps from the US Geological Survey from NASA from the satellites and we can see where that break is and that's how we know where to go where we'll find the most birds, whales, whatever. And along this line where these currents kind of meet where the Gulf Stream and the Labrador current that's coming down south that cold water current and the Gulf Stream meet we'll get the we'll get stuff like this. So this is sargassum weed. And sargassum weed is a, not a, actually a plant. It's, a, it's an algae. It's a free-floating al free algae. It has these little pockets, these little bubbles in it that allows it to float. And uh, sargassum, you may have heard of the sargasso sea, the sargassum sea. It's kind of a, in the mythology of the Bermuda Triangle, it, it's part of a, a, plays a role there. Sort of mysterious. But essentially what happens is when these two currents run up against each other, uh, all the stuff gets in the middle of it. And a lot of with the cool thing about these, um, it looks like there's not much going on. It looks like these weedy fields almost, like someone has mowed the lawn and dumped all the grass in the middle of the ocean here. Um, but these, the sargassum, which when the Gulf Stream is running really fast, can make these giant clumps like that. But perhaps more typically are sort of these big, um, I don't know, 30, 40 square meter clumps of weeds just kind of scattered around, are really important as uh, nurseries for, for small fish for sea turtles. So after the sea turtles hatch, this is where the babies go and they hang out here for a few years until they get big enough. Um, and so you oftentimes find a lot of really cool stuff. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll go and we'll um, get a big old net and pull a, pull a bunch of the sargassum up and start to pick through it. And you can find all sorts of little larval fish. You can find uh, those sargassum fish, the eels. They're not, they're not eels, but they look like seahorses where they're all kind of stretched out and they have those fleshy fins. Sometimes we find stuff like that. Little tiny things, little pelagic crabs, little shrimps. You can see one of the crabs here in this picture. Um, but there's all sorts of really cool stuff. And as you can imagine, if there's all sorts of little fish, all sorts of little invertebrates, all sorts of neat critters, uh, you're going to find a lot of birds there too. Frequently, you find things like sooty terns, bridal terns, kind of riding right up against that sargassum, uh, sitting on the sargassum. Sometimes there's driftwood and, and frequently, unfortunately, garbage in the sargassum, and the birds will just kind of sit on top of it. So what people perhaps may not realize is that most pelagic birds are, in fact, nocturnal. That is when they do most of their feeding, because at night, especially at these places where the geology, geography, and the surface temperature of the water kind of meets to make cool things happen is uh, probably the largest migration of biomass on the planet. 
but it's not things like wildebeest or birds or anything like that. It's actually these little tiny microscopic or, or close to microscopic organisms that at night, they essentially come out of that mesopelagic zone, which is about you know 100 meters to 1,000 meters down, uh, 300 to 3,000 feet. And they rise up in the, they have a, a vertical migration. So they rise up in the water column and they come up to the, to the top zone and the, where they feed on things like phytoplankton that needs the sun. And um, that's when these, these organisms, these storm petrels, these petrels, these shearwaters, this is what they're eating. This is why they have such big eyes, why their faces are so cute, because they're, they're feeding mostly at night. And during the day, when we are out there looking for them, uh, they're mostly kind of chilling, floating around, going places, floating on the water, things like that. But all, these, um, all this zooplankton goes all the way back down during the day into the dark mesopelagic zone, which is um, much darker. The sunlight does not penetrate down there. And um, during the day, they're down there. And at night, they come up. And that's when everything gets, that's when all the, all the magic happens. Unfortunately, we're not typically out there to see that happen. But you can get out there pretty early in the morning. And so because of this sort of unique situation that we have off the coast of North Carolina, uh, we have birds from all over the world that visit here. And that's one of the things that makes uh, this part of the world so, so amazing. Um, we have Caribbean nesting species that like uh, black cat petrel and Audubon shearwater that nest on the Caribbean islands. And even during the summer when they have chicks on the nest, they're making the flight daily up to the Gulf Stream uh, to feed on, these, on, this, on this kind of amazing surplus of, of organisms. We have birds that typically breed in the Arctic, things like skua and Arctic tern. Uh, Jaegers, uh, leeches, storm petrels that breed off the coast of Atlantic Canada. They come down to this place to get this food. We have birds that breed in the Western Atlantic, like bandrum storm petrel and Cory shearwater. And then we have birds that nest uh, in the subantarctic islands, like sooty shearwater, like Wilson storm petrel, that come all the way up into the North Atlantic and frequently congregate at a place like the Gulf Stream off the coast of North Carolina, which is amazing to think about. Um, that's one of the things I love about pelagic birding more than anything is that you never know what you're going to get. It's this amazing cohort of species that finds its way here um, from all over the world. And anything is possible, but frequently even the stuff that's normal is uh, pretty cool. So when we talk about pelagic species, as I said, we're typically talking about procelliriforms, tube noses, so we're called tube noses, things like shearwaters, storm petrels, petrels, albatrosses. If we're lucky, that's more of a Southern Ocean, Pacific Ocean thing than North Atlantic, but we do sometimes get albatrosses. Tropic birds, these those are really cool. They're actually more closely related to um, cormorants. They have all four of their feet are webbed. And the seagoing larids, larids, skulls and terns, things like Jaegers, skuas. Arctic tern, Sabin's goal. Those are pelagic. These are birds that um, only come to land for the most part to breed, but they spend most of their time out in the ocean, out in the open ocean, and they are uniquely adapted to be able to take advantage of this uh, incredible landscape or seascape rather, as it were. Um, so I talk about tube noses. What I mean when I say tube noses are that these birds, they, have, they actually have tubes on their noses. They're a little protected nose. And what that actually is, is a, um, it's an adaptation that allows them to drink seawater. So they have little glands inside their, inside their heads, inside their mouths, where they drink the seawater and actually separates the salt from the seawater. So if you or I were to drink seawater as people who were, um, you know, castaways in the, in the 18th, 19th century, realize that's a good way to die. Uh, birds can do it. They can make, can survive eat, drinking seawater. They have to. It's it's the only thing that's available for much of the year. And so um, what happens is the salt actually comes out through those little protuberances, through those little nose. So they they can take in the water and they exude the they get rid of the salt. That's an amazing adaptation and, and necessary for what they do. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these tube noses and what they do and where they come from and why they're neat, uh, as if you need more reason for that. And I'm going to start with probably the most common. Uh, most common pelagic species off the coast of North Carolina most of the summer months, and that is uh, Cory shearwater. It's big, it's kind of these lazy flights, has a big yellow nose, big yellow bill. They are uh, pretty commonly found uh, in most of the warm months off North Carolina. You're, you're not going to miss them. Sometimes it's close to, you can see them from shore sometimes, and infrequently. 
But uh, one of the amazing things about this bird that is so common in the Western Atlantic is that they breed in the Eastern Atlantic. So this is a bird that breeds in the islands of uh, the Azores, Madeira, and the Canary Islands, which are off the coast of uh, Spain and Portugal and North Africa. Uh, it is where they, where they come from. Um, you can see right here, there's a picture of them. They nest in actually, so these Madeira and, and Canary, these islands are very windswept. They're very rocky. There's not a lot of uh, vegetation on them. They have all these cool little um, cracks and crevices inside the rocks, and that is where the birds will nest. So a lot of tube noses are burrow nesters. They burrow into the substrate, be it rocks, be it dirt, be it whatever. Um, of course, your waters aren't too picky. They pretty much nest in those uh, in the cracks that they can find on all these islands. And um, they are they breed in our summer. So the birds that we are seeing in the summer and the summer months are ones that are actually probably have chicks back in uh, those islands off of North Africa. So they are making the flight all the way, which can be like a two week flight, all the way to the Gulf Stream and then kind of circling back, looping back around uh, where they feed they feed their chicks. And um, usually one of the parents stays on the eggs, incubating it while the other parent goes out and does these sort of long tours to catch, to get food. And they, they take turns. Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, these are birds that are able to, so, so I, I, I called the North Atlantic a blue desert. It very much is a blue desert for the most part. Most of the, most of the water out there is pretty much, it's very difficult to find any sort of food for these birds. Um, they have excellent senses of smell. They can follow oil uh, for very long distances. So they, a lot of times when they find food is they, they smell it, which is why when we are out looking for pelagic birds, a lot of times we will trail menhaden oil, fish oil off the back of the boat and uh, the birds smell it and they come in, they're kind of curious about what's going on and how we get a good look at them. But they're able to smell small bits of this oil or fish oil over a very long distance. Um, you know, in, 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 a non-artificial environment. This could be something like, uh, you know, a swordfish has worked its way through a a school of fish, and you know, swordfish hunt by essentially swimming into a big school of fish and swinging their swinging their nose around and injuring the fish, and then picking up off all the injured ones. Uh, they can tell if a, a, bird, a fish has done that. They can go there and they can pick off the, the extra fish. If a whale dies and a whale is floating somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, the birds are able to find it by smelling it from uh, incredible distances away. Uh, they're pretty amazing animals. Uh, Audubon shearwater is another fairly common bird. It's a little bit smaller than the Cory shearwater, but they do not breed anywhere near the Cory shearwaters. Audubon shearwater is uh, they breed in, in the Caribbean. So this is a Caribbean nesting species. So pretty much all the little islands in the greater and lesser Antilles have Audubon shearwater um, colonies such that they are on them. And um, they are actually burrowing birds. So they will they make their burrows in, um, so a lot of times these birds nest in mountains, mountainous areas. There's a lot of the volcanoes, or a lot of the islands in the Caribbean are volcanic in origin. And so they're, they're very tall even if they're not very big. And so there's a lot of room up in the high areas, high elevations for them to nest. So they bury, they bury themselves in the nest and they have a big old uh, a chick, um, usually one chick per pair. You can see a photo of that uh, in there in the corner. Um, so these, these, these chicks have to withstand their parents leaving for very long periods of time uh, before they come back with food. And so they tend to be enormous, you know, really fat, uh, you know, a lot of, um, a lot, of, uh, a lot of fat on them so they can withstand those long distances. And in fact, that was a, a huge problem for uh, most, many pelagic species because when sailors would come along on these islands where these birds nest, they would um, take the chicks, just pull them right out and boil them down because they were a lot fat. That's um, a problem why, why a lot of these birds are endangered, unfortunately. But Audubon Shearwood is not one of those birds. It's actually done quite well. As I said, found in the Northern Hemisphere summer, present in the Gulf Stream throughout the warm months. Um, Really neat bird, very big tail compared to some of the other shearwaters. It makes gives them a, a very distinct appearance when you can see them flying, flying around. Great shearwater is uh, another one. They're pre they breed in our winter. So this is one of those birds that um, that is a southern hemisphere bird that comes into the North Atlantic in their winter, which is our summer. Uh, and fascinatingly enough, they are. Uh, Pretty much the entire population, almost the entire population, something like 85% of the great shearwater population nests on an island called Tristan de Cunha, 
which is in the middle of the South Atlantic. Um, it is so isolated that uh, when the British, when British sailors found it, they actually one of the islands in the Tristan de Cunha uh, archipelago is called uh, Inaccessible Island. There's a native uh, flightless rail there as well. Um, also down there was St. Helena. Those of you who may know European history know that is uh, one of the places where the French um, uh, stuck Napoleon after he, uh, after he was uh, 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 removed from power. So they stuck him on St. Helena. He eventually made his way back. So it wasn't quite inaccessible enough. Uh, but you can see a picture of Tristan de Cunha down there in the corner. Uh, it's a volcanic island. And uh, it is not only home uh, for great shearwaters, it's actually home to a, a, a number of pelagic species and, and very large uh, tube nose colonies. Also a lot of penguins. There are rockhopper penguins on this island as well. Um, it, the shearwater, shearwaters, petrels, all of these pelagic birds tend to look for these islands that are in the middle of nowhere um, to nest because these islands traditionally have not had any sort of mammalian predators. So these islands until uh, explorers came along were devoid of, of humans, period. Um, they had mostly birds. They were almost entirely birds. And as, uh, you know, 18th, 19th century explorers, uh, they would frequently use these islands as, as waypoints as to stop off. Um, they would a lot of times release animals there, uh, goats and pigs frequently, um, which would denude the landscape and essentially uh, cause a lot of problems for birds. And so there are a lot of these islands um, that conservation efforts have been made to remove those sort of non-native predators, non-native mammals from them. Uh, unfortunately, Tristan de Cunha is not one of them. They still have a, a goat problem. Uh, there actually even is a little town there of old British uh, settlers. I believe this is a, one of the, one of the <laughs> still technically um, uh, maintained by, by the British, but um, they've done a pretty good job. Most of the, the pelagic species do pretty well. Um, great shearwater is one of the more common ones. And sooty shearwater, perhaps you've heard this. This is, um, interestingly enough, one of the most abundant birds on the planet that most people have not seen because it's almost entirely found uh, offshore. They are another one of these uh, breeds in our winter, southern hemisphere summer, present in the Gulf Stream most of the warm years. They, uh, they breed on the islands, subantarctic islands. So all the islands around uh, southern South America and uh, New Zealand uh, frequently have sooty shearwaters on them. Um, they have one of the longest migration flights or the longest flights of any bird on the planet. Um, they, they, these ones that breed, the ones that we have in the North Atlantic are, are from the Falklands and South Georgia primarily. And they, uh, they undertake this huge figure eight migration that takes them from Falkland Islands. There you can see the map down in the lower left corner, all the way around, kind of looping around the North Atlantic and then looping back down uh, the coast of Africa, back to South Georgia every year. It's something like 10,000 miles every single year, and uh, which is pretty remarkable. Now, these birds are made to, to move around on the ocean. They, they do it by what is called dynamic soaring. So if you're familiar with turkey vultures, you know that they, they ride thermals. They love riding thermals, which are pretty simple to explain on land. Uh, the land rises as the day goes on, that the temperature of the, the land rises, the ground increases, causes the air to lift because warm air rises and the birds catch these and they kind of spiral up into the air. And that's how birds of prey get around for the most part, especially in migration. So what the sooty shearwaters are doing and all the pelagic birds in general are taking advantage of these little thermals that are created by the, by the waves. So every time a wave crests, there's a little bit of air that's displaced. And so what these birds are doing are essentially riding these little currents of displaced air through the troughs of the waves uh, without expending very much energy at all. And it allows them to travel enormous distances with their wings kind of outstretched. They actually, most of the time, if you're watching them out on the ocean, they, they very infrequently flap. Um, they look kind of awkward when they do, like, uh, like uh, unfolding an umbrella, like having to unfold these huge, huge wings. Uh, for the most part, they, they don't move their wings at all. They're just straight out kind of rising and falling on these little tiny micro thermals that are created by the winds. It's uh, pretty remarkable. Wilson storm petrel is another one, another extremely common species. And this uh, allows me to talk a little bit about uh, molt and birds. I know that you may be um, turning off your Zoom call 
because you don't want to hear about molts. But um, it's actually one of the more useful things to talk about when you're when we're trying to de- trying to identify um, pelagic birds. So birds tend to. This is true of all birds, not necessarily pelagic birds. Birds tend to go through three or maybe even four extremely energy intensive times in their lives. Um, migration, chicks feeding chicks, and molt. Molt is uh, the third one. It's a very intensive time. So most of the time, birds will not do any two of those these three things at the same time. They will do them all separately, which is why you typically see passerine birds molting after the chicks get out of the nest you know, in the late summer. And uh, pelagic birds are the same, are, are just like that, because they Though their, their feathers tend to be go through a little more stress because salt water can be so corrosive. But uh, these are Wilson storm petrels. They come up in May, which is their fall. So they are breeding in our winter. And uh, we can frequently tell the adult birds from the, ver- from the first year birds because of that molt. So that the young birds do not replace their flight feathers after they have fledged when they first leave because their flight feathers are brand new. They don't need to. But the adults, as soon as they finish raising those chicks, as soon as those chicks are out of the nest, they began to lose their flight feathers. And so you can see this in this first bird. So the lead bird is an adult bird. But as you can see, it's got that kind of weird notch where the primary feathers are, where the outer flight feathers are. Um, that's because it's losing them. And then it loses them uh, from the inside out. And you can see a little bit of a brand new primary feather coming in on the inside of that bird. Uh, but the younger birds, which are those two birds trailing, don't have that at all. So you can see they're fair, they're, they're, um, their wings are completely round, no missing feathers. So that's kind of neat to do. You can pick out the adult Wilson storm petrels from the, the young ones when they're pitter-pattering, doing their little dance on the surface of the water as they pick up uh, microscopic tiny little things that we, that we can't see. Um, but it becomes more important when we talk about some of the other storm petrels. So I talk about band rump storm petrels. This is a really cool bird. And one of the things, another thing that I really like about pelagic birds is that they are frequently examples of some of the frontiers of ornithology, of speciation, of what we think of as species of evolution. And uh, band rump storm petrel is a great example of that. So band rump storm petrel, like, like Cory's shearwater, they nest on those islands off of North Africa, Azores, Madeira, Canaries, and Cape Verde. We know that there are a couple different populations, however, because there is a population of these storm petrels that breeds in our summer, so in May, April, May, they will go to their nesting burrows on these islands and raise chicks. Um, and then in August, they will leave. And then they will be replaced by a completely different population of band rump storm petrels that breeds throughout our winter. And the two never intersect. Like the summer breeding birds stay with the summer breeding birds and the winter breeding birds stay with the winter breeding birds. And they don't, they may look to us more or less identical, but something about those birds is telling them that they they separate. And um, they actually even use the same burrows. So like the summer breeding birds will use a burrow, they'll have a chick, they'll move out. The winter breeding birds will come in and they'll use the exact same places, the exact same burrows, but there's no, inter- inter- there's no interaction between those two populations. So how do you tell these birds apart? Well, for a long time, we couldn't. We didn't know what population of band rump storm petrels we were seeing in the Western Atlantic and still we, until we started paying attention to molt. So you can see this bird right here in the middle. This is from the Grant's population, which is breeds in our winter. And so after they breed, after they finish breeding in the very early spring, they disperse across the North Atlantic and that's when we start seeing them. And like the Wilson storm petrels, that's when they start losing their flight feathers. So you can see in this bird, you can see the brown feather towards the tip. That's an old worn feather, it's being replaced and you can see a little bit of a wedge there. The wings are shaped a little weird there at the tip. Then there's another population, which we've called Madeiran petrel. Maybe. We don't really know. They breed in our summer. And when they're present in the Gulf Stream, because birds do not have chicks and molt at the same time, when they show up, they do not show any of those little notches in their wings. They are completely completely clean, like that bird on the, on the right. It's, it's, it's wild stuff, how these birds know to not interact with each other, but um, that's, that's what they're doing. And it's quite possible that there could be cryptic species hiding in plain sight, different, completely different species of birds, genetically speaking, um, that at some point in the past diverged and now they're doing their own thing and we have to try and figure out. Birds know, the birds can tell each other apart. We, we can't do it. 
but it's really neat puzzle to try and unravel when you are out on the Gulf Stream. And uh, Banner Up Storm Petrol is a great way to tow it. Now you might think Banner Up Storm Petrol, Wilson Storm Petrol, they look very similar. They do in fact, as a kind of a classic Storm Petrol look, all dark with a white rump. But you can see here, uh, this is heavily, both of these birds are pretty heavily molting. Um, you can tell the difference between them pretty easily. The Wilson Storm Petrol has those little tiny paddle shaped wings and the uh, Banner Up Storm Petrol has real long kind of sheer watery wings and they fly very different as well which is the first thing that when you're looking for the band ramp storm petrol through the very common Wilsons, the first thing you notice is that this is a bird that it looks like a Ferrari flying next to a bunch of Volkswagen bugs, like the way that they move compared to the, the Wilson storm petrols. It's actually pretty neat. It's hard to, it's hard to describe with still photos, but you, I guess you'll have to take my word for it or come out to North Carolina to go off the, to go offshore. Um, Leech of storm petrol is the third one. The entire population, almost the entire population nests on one tiny island off of uh, Newfoundland, uh, Bacalo Island. They breed in our summer. They have long wings like the band rump, but a forked tail. Um, another thing to note, as I said, pelagic birds primarily nocturnal. Um, they only come to their nests after dark. This is important in a couple birds that I'll talk about in the future, but what this means for a bird like the leech of storm petrel, I had the good fortune to travel to Newfoundland uh, a couple summers ago uh, to, to do a bird thing. And I was with my friend, Jared Clark, who does bird tours uh, out of St. John's. And we went to these islands to look at the puffins and the gannets and all sorts of cool stuff. It's a fantastic place. If you ever get the opportunity, once we're traveling again, if you ever get the opportunity to go to Newfoundland, I would absolutely encourage you to do so. It's, a, it's an amazing place. Um, but he said that these islands that we were on, uh, where we we're looking at puffins, often also host um, hundreds of pairs of leeches storm petrels, but no one ever sees them. So some of the largest leeches storm petrel colonies in the world are in Newfoundland, but he had never seen one. My friend Jared had never seen one because they only come after dark and then they leave before the sun up. So you have these colonies of birds here that no one ever sees. No one ever knew they existed, and that's important. I'll I'll, we'll talk a little bit about why, why that's important in the next couple birds, but it's amazing. Um, he said that the only time people had ever seen a leech of storm petrels in Newfoundland for, uh, regularly is uh, if there's a storm that comes through and they get blown in and they get, you know, wrecked on the shore and then people will see them. But for the most part, these birds are, and frequently that happens with the very young birds when they, when they first leave the nest. Um, but for the most part, they have these massive colonies that no one ever sees. I did not see Leech of Storm Petrol when I was in, when I was in Newfoundland. So I'm talking about the Pterodromas, which to my mind are sort of the, uh, the landlords of, uh, of the Gulf Stream. These are the birds that people come to this place to see. Uh, Pterodroma Petrels, uh, Pterodroma means a uh, wing runner. Uh, these are truly masters of the air. They are amazing flyers. They are fast. They are curious. They are some of the, you know, from their natural history, some of them are more interesting uh, of the of the pelagic species, since so I'm going to talk about a couple of them uh, here. Black cap petrel is the classic Gulf Stream, North Carolina, the bird that people come to Hatteras and take the boat rides out to see. Um, they see them most most time. Um, they are they are fantastic. They breed in our winter, so they are Caribbean breeding species that breed in our winter, which is unusual. But they are present in the Gulf Stream year round. And um, the entire world population of black-capped petrel is known to nest only on three mountains on the island of Hispaniola. Two of them are in Haiti, and one of them is in the Dominican Republic. If you know anything about Haiti, you know that it is an extremely poor country. Um, the fact that they have natural, national parks at all is uh, pretty remarkable. When the earthquake hit a few years ago, there was worry that uh, you know desperate people were going to go into the national parks and, and start you know, using the resources there. Uh, not unjustifiably, uh, but uh, thankfully they were able to, to save them. These birds nest in the very high mountains on the volcanoes. They only come after dark, as I said, and they have uh, the name uh, Diablatine, which in the local language in, in French Creole means uh, little devil. So they're called that because when they fly into their nesting, so for, for forever, people did not know that these birds existed because as I said, they would only come after dark and leave before night. So people would hear them come in. And when they come in to their nesting burrows, they make the weirdest kind of laughing, shrieking noises. And people thought they were devils. They thought they were evil spirits. And so they got the name Diablatine. And it wasn't until much later that they were discovered to be these pelagic species that were nesting in cloud forests 
of uh, of Haiti and the Dominican Republic, which is remarkable. Um, they nest in the, the volcanic cracks and the crevices. You can see the, the nesting bird there um, on the lower the lower right. That's a baby black cap petrel. So we're very interested in these birds in North Carolina. Um, some of the people at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh have been doing work on these birds in the Dominican Republic in Haiti for many years. And this is a photo of um, Ted Simons, who is uh, a professor of ornithology at the North Carolina State University, um, rappelling off of one of these volcanic mountains to find a black cat petrel nest. So you can get an idea of where these birds are nesting. Um, they're pine forests. They're these high elevation pine forests frequently up into the cloud forests, even very high. They're in these cracks and these impossible cracks on these sheer cliffs that you have to get to. And on the photo on the right, you can see the arrow. That arrow is pointing to the hole that the black cat petrel, where they nest. So you can understand why these birds were unknown for so very long. And in fact, thought to be extinct for about 150 years because no one knew where they were. No one knew where they were nesting. No one knew where they were going. Um, it's pretty, pretty fascinating stuff. So here's another mystery, black cat petrel mystery. So black cat petrel now here in 2021 is one of the better known of the pterodroma petrels, but there's a lot we don't know about them. So here in the Gulf Stream, we frequently get two different varieties of black cat petrels. Some of them are extremely light colored. They have that white forehead, very little tiny cap. And some of them are extremely dark. They have a lot of dark underwings as this bird on the right, very dark cap, very you know big cap. The, the dark birds tend to be much, a little bit heavier, a little bit bigger um, than the more slender light colored birds. We've been calling these both black cat petrels. It's quite possible that these might be two completely different species that are kind of hiding in plain sight again. Um, we don't know where they nest. We don't know where the white capped ones nest, where the paler ones nest. The dark ones are the, the ones that are in Haiti and Dominican Republic. We don't know where the light capped ones go. So, you know, here we are in 2021, people have been doing ornithology for a couple hundred years. There are still mysteries out there for birds that we see fairly often, see fairly regularly. There's no mystery about where these birds go when they're not nesting. We can see them off the coast of North Carolina with great regularity. They tend to even, if you go out in late August, you can see as many as 50 or 60 of them. But um, we, we don't know where they're going. <laughs> they could be anywhere. They could be nesting somewhere in Dominican Republic. They could be nesting on Jamaica. Uh, there's been suspicion that some are in uh, a couple of the other islands down there. We have no idea. It's a mystery. And uh, the greatest mystery of all is the Bermuda petrel, the cahal, because this is a bird that was thought to be extinct for over 200 years. It was discovered in the 1600s, um, nesting in Bermuda. Bermuda is settled. The British come there, they, they, they set up shop. Uh, they realize that these little baby petrels that are in these holes in the, uh, the islands around the harbor, are, uh, they taste good, so they grab them, they eat them, and after a while, there are none left. So for almost 200 years, we thought that this bird was lost. Until in the 1950s, uh, one, hit a, one hit a lighthouse, and uh, someone on Bermuda was picked up by a, a boy on Bermuda uh, named uh, David Wingate. He, they sent it into the, the, the Smithsonian, not the Smithsonian, the, the museum in, in New York. New York Museum of Natural History, and they said they were shocked. They thought this is a bird that we thought was extinct for 200 years, and here we have a, a specimen of one. Um, so they sent some people down, and they started looking, and they ended up finding the birds nesting on a tiny rock called Nunsuch Island in the middle of the harbor uh, near the where the main city, main town of Bermuda is. So you can see up there in the upper right that is the uh, north side of the island of Bermuda. It's a big harbor, that dot, um, the little dot right beneath the sign that says St. James Inlet, there's a little peninsula, an airfield that sticks out. That little island in the middle of the dot was where these Bermuda petrels were nesting, unknown to, it, to people for 200 years. Uh, as I said, they only come after dark. They leave before in the morning. There were not that many of them. They were, they were literally flying under the radar, essentially. <laughs> um, the, so David Wingate grows up to become this... Uh, pretty much the, the, the conservation guy. He ends up getting a job with, uh, with the Bermuda Department of Conservation. He starts doing work with these Bermuda petrels. He finds them. He ends up making these uh, artificial nest holes, essentially, for them. 
you can see it up in the upper left corner. It's essentially a like a little concrete bunker with a lift with a lid on the top that you could lift it up and you can look in there and you can see the baby Bermuda petrel. He started watching them. And um, he started bringing them back slowly, 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 started noticing that there were more and more of them. Uh, one of the things that they was very important was that they got rid of all the goats on Nunsuch Island. Uh, goats, huge problem for pelagic birds. They started repopulating the island, and that is the island right there in the lower in the lower right. Um, repopulating it with native Bermudan uh, plants with shrubbery, and uh, the birds started coming back uh, to the point where there are about, uh, I want to say, 90 to 100 breeding pairs now. There still are not very many, but people are they're, they're still growing. It turns out the biggest problem with Bermuda petrel, and this is all done by David Wingate, who I, I think ended up um, getting the Order of the British Empire because of, of his work with uh, with um, with Bermuda petrels, bringing them back from extinction. He has since retired. He retired about five years ago. He's still around. Um, and he was replaced by, a, a, I cannot remember his name, um, essentially a guy that he brought up to do his work, uh, who we mentored for a very long time, another Bermudan, um, who is now in charge of, his name's Jeremy, oh, I wish I should have checked before, but, um, but, and, but he is doing the work that, um, what, that David Wingate started. Um, they started putting little GPS trackers on the adult Bermuda petrels so they could find out where they were going. It uh, turns out that they're flying like up the Gulf Stream all the way into Atlantic Canada and doing a big loop around the North Atlantic before coming back to Bermuda, um, which is not terribly unusual for pelagic birds. But when you think about, you know, the, the North Atlantic is enormous. These birds are quite small. There are not that many of them. It makes you realize how they could have um, gone undetected for so very long. Um, but Bermuda petrel, I think it's on the money in Bermuda now. Like they're very proud of the work that they've done to uh, to protect uh, this bird and they're, they're doing much better now. The problem now is obviously sea level rise, whether or not it will swamp out this little, um, this little Nunsuch Island in the Bermuda Harbor. Um, they have started moving these birds to other islands in the area. They're a little bit higher uh, to see if they will take to those places as well. Uh, and they have been for the most part. So it's an ongoing project, but uh, it's, it's an amazing story. The Bermuda petrel thought to be extinct for so long. Um, turns out was, was, was there all along. Uh, bridal turn, so we'll move away from tube noses and just talk briefly about some of the um, some of the other stuff you can find out there. Bridal turn, um, these nest in in South South Florida and in the Caribbean, pretty widespread throughout the Caribbean. They're cool because they um, they like to sit on the flotsam in the middle of the sargassum patches. So anything that is floating, uh, be it driftwood, be it uh, a piece of uh, I don't know, some piece of lumber, as in this picture, be it a piece like a styrofoam cooler that got thrown off a, a cruise ship. Like they'll, if they'll find it, they'll sit on it. Uh, and that's frequently how you find them. They're really neat birds. Um, hurricane waifs. So they're very good at following hurricanes, following the storms that kind of travel up the Gulf Stream. Um, and frequently they get blown inland quite a bit. They're one of the classic hurricane birds. Their turns, they're very light. Their wing load is very high. They, um, you know, they're, they're all wing. So they just kind of fly off into, uh, into wherever the wind takes them. And then as soon as it stops, they turn around and head back to the ocean. Uh, Arctic Tern is another one you've probably heard. Uh, Arctic Tern, uh, forever it's been, um, it's been pointed to as the, the most impressive migration of any bird on the planet. And uh, for a long time, it held that title until some sooty, turn, sooty shear water work was done. And the sooty shear water uh, grabbed it. There's the ones in the Pacific Ocean do a big figure eight like they do in the Atlantic that covers an enormous amount of territory. Uh, until not that long ago, this was probably not more than five or 10 years ago, they put uh, GPS trackers on the backs of Arctic terns to find out where they went. Um, they knew that they were going from the Arctic to the Antarctic every year, uh, but they had no idea at the extent of where they go. I mean, that's not, that's only the, the, the only the start of it. Uh, it turns out individual Arctic terns end up flying not just back and forth between Greenland and Antarctica, but sometimes they'll take a little detour over into the Indian Ocean. They'll cruise around the uh, Cape of Good Hope in Africa. They'll spend a lot of time along the, the western coast of Africa in the fall as they're um, kind of making their way back north um, because they, or rather south. Um, yeah, and it turns out that they're doing something like 23,000 miles a year, some individuals. Uh, so they got the, rightfully, they got the crown for the longest migration back uh, from the city Shearwater. But this is, this is some of the recent uh, GPS tracking. 
Uh, so this is uh, three different birds. You can see the three different colors. I can see where they're going. They are, but you can also see some important places where they are, where they are pausing. They're always going like that spot up in the North Atlantic, uh, right in the middle of the North Atlantic between Ireland and uh, Newfoundland uh, is very important for them. Also, they tend to congregate uh, off the coast of South Africa as well. Neat, neat birds. And they're doing things that are, that are completely unbelievable. White-tailed tropic bird. Tropical birds, another kind of pelagic species. Uh, they spend almost their entire time uh, out over the ocean, but unlike um, unlike the tube noses, they do not stay close to the close to the the sea surface. So tube noses are using that dynamic surf dynamic uh, soaring uh, from the waves. White-tailed tropic birds are very high. They stay up very high. Amazing thing about white-tailed tropic birds, um, when I have done when I have gone out and looked for them on pelagics. Um, you, you have to look up every once in a while. And the funny, uh, my, my, so what will happen is that you will be looking at tube noses soaring off the side of the boat. And um, all of a sudden someone will just look up and say, oh, there's a white-tailed tropic bird. And, and you look up and there's a white-tailed tropic bird just kind of circling around, <laughs> around the boat. Like it came out of nowhere. And I think that they actually do sort of that way in a little bit. They, they stay up very high until they see um, a fishing boat or a school of fish or whatever would get their interest and then kind of dive down to where we can see them. So they're most of the time they're spinning uh, way, way too high for us to see it. And then if they find something interesting, they'll come down. Um, yeah, but they're, they're fantastic with these long, gorgeous tails, very graceful flyers. And uh, skuas and Jaegers, we see quite a few of these as well. Uh, Long-tailed Jaeger, which nests in the, all these nest in the Arctic, uh, except for South Polar Skua which nests around the Antarctic and comes to the North Atlantic in their winter, our summer, which is the bird in the lower right. Um, so these birds are not, they don't pick things off the surface like the, like the tube noses and the, um, and the, on all the other, and the turns. Um, they actually, they're hunters. So what they do is they, they chase down pelagic birds and force them to, to give up their, their food that they store in their crop. So they will uh, frequently chase black cat petrels, shearwaters, um, tropic birds, and um, they're, they're, they're very adept aerialists. They're very quick flyers, amazing flyers, and they'll chase them down and harass them until those birds throw up their food and uh, that's stored in their crop. And then the skua will come down and take it and eat it. And that's, that's how they get their food. Um, funny thing about skuas is that they're in the, the Storcorarius group. If you're familiar with scientific names, Storcorarius is their genus. Um, the Latin translation of that actually means dung eater, poop eater. Uh, that is because uh, when people first saw these birds chasing uh, seabirds to try and get their foods, try and get their food, um, they thought that the birds were defecating and the, then the skua would come up and scoop that up and eat that. They didn't realize that they were voiding their crop. Um, so they're forever um, given the name uh, scat eater, poop eater, stricorarius, dung eater. So they're, they're much nicer than that. Uh, you don't just see birds out here in the uh, Gulf Stream. There's a lot of other cool stuff to see, like flying fish. Um, if you think pelagic, tube nose, uh, biology is unknown, uh, we didn't get a load of flying fish. They are a taxonomic mess. But there's a lot of really cool ones. Most of these birds don't even have common, most of these birds, most of these fish uh, don't even have common names. Um, so Steve Howell, uh, who you may have heard, he's a field guide author, actually came around and started giving them just names <laughs> based on what he saw because no one else was doing it. So you get cool things like um, Midnight Wing and um, I forget what the little guy with the, with the spots on the, um, the spots on the wings are, spots on the fins are, but you frequently see a lot of flying fish in the Sargassum. Um, they, when the boat is going full steam, they'll fly off the, fly off the front you know, glide off however many meters. They're pretty amazing. Um, it's almost impossible to get some photos of them. I'm, I'm very impressed by these. Uh, whales as well. A lot of cool cetaceans in the Gulf Stream for the same reason that the birds are there. Uh, it's the same reason that the, the big mammals are there as well. Uh, this is a sperm whale. Uh, I took this photo. This is uh, probably the most common large mammal in the Gulf Stream. Um, they're really, I mean, sperm whales are, are super cool, but uh, the experiences with them 
out there are not always terribly exciting. They tend to just kind of loaf on the surface. They look like a like a big wet rubber tire <laughs> out on the horizon. Uh, but if you could get, you can see below the surface, they're actually really cool. Uh, Kate, who is the first mate on Brian Pattison's seabirding uh, tours, took a GoPro and put it on a stick one time when they got one, and they stuck it underneath the surface and got a video of the the, the uh, young sperm whale kind of lingering on the surface. It's very cool. Uh, lots of dolphins as well. Uh, things like Risso's dolphin or Grampus up there in the upper left with all the scars. Uh, the males tend to fight each other. And so they end up with all this sort of unique pattern of, of scarring on their, on their bodies. Uh, as spinner do spotted dolphins, uh, pilot whales, and uh, beaked whales. It's an excellent place to see beaked whales, which is another one of the most mysterious animals on the earth because they are very deep divers. They look like giant elongated dolphins. Um, they're very deep divers. They don't come to the surface very often, and their people don't know much about them except when they when they beach themselves. So we don't have a lot of visual um, visual sightings of them, live sightings of them, I should say. This one down here is a Cuvier's beaked whale, which is one of the larger ones. And sea turtles, lots of cool sea turtles out there as well. Uh, loggerhead and leatherback are the most common encountered. Uh, in the warm water loggerhead, uh, they, both of these animals get very can get very big. Uh, leatherback especially. Leatherback sea turtle is super unique. It's actually um, kind of warm-blooded, which is very unusual for a reptile, but they can, to some extent, um, maintain their body temperature, even in very cold environments. So you typically see them when the colder water comes down, and that allows them to search for food in cold water environments in the North Atlantic and North Pacific as well. Really amazing creatures. They mostly, both of these mostly eat jellyfish, which you do see from time to time out there. Uh, this is the boat we take. This is the Stormy Petrel 2. Um, this photo was taken from a kite. They hung a GoPro from a kite and put it up. You can see the string right there. Um, but it's a very comfortable boat. It's um, fun. This is sort of what the what the, what it looks like. You are in the middle of the ocean. There is no no land to be seen. You're usually about 40 miles off. The water is blue and gorgeous and um, Hopefully you see a lot of birds. So um, yeah, this is just some more photos of, uh, of us out on the boat. And uh, the, typically the best time of year to come out for the most diversity is late May. There are the, a lot of trips run out in late May. Uh, it seems to be the time when all the Southern Hemisphere breeding species are starting to arrive. So it's not quite the peak for them, but there's still a lot of them around. All the wet Eastern Atlantic species are there. And it's still, you're still lingering some of the Arctic nesters. So things like Skua, Leech's Storm Petrel, uh, Jaegers, and stuff like that that breed on the tundra have not quite left yet. They usually don't until, uh, until it gets a little bit later. So there's a big diversity of birds out there that time of year. So um, that's all I got. If you have any questions about pelagic birds, about pelagic birding, I would be very happy to take them. I have not looked at all at the chat. So if you have been chatting about me, I have no idea that that's happening. Um, I'm going to close this and thank you so much for, for listening. I, uh, I appreciate it. And I hope to see you, hope to see you out there sometime. Yeah, Nate, uh, thank you very much. But yes, we've been chatting behind your back. Oh no. Uh <laughs> I'm going to try and stop my share. Here we go. No, no worries. No worries. Uh, I, I, my, my question is, being a person who would love to go spend some time on the Outer Banks, is there any chance of seeing any of these birds from shore? Some of them, and a lot of it depends on the wind. So if you have a, a period of strong easterly winds, so winds coming out of the east, um, which does happen in the spring, you can see some of them offshore. So things like Cory shearwater, sooty shearwater, Audubon shearwater are sometimes seen from shore. Um, tropic birds, less common, but sometimes. Uh, Jaegers and skuas are probably the most common thing you can see from shore, but even that's kind of a, it depends on the wind. Um, things like black cat petrel, I mean, you gotta go, you gotta go out to see those. They do not come any closer than the shelf break. So um, some of the real specialty birds, uh, Bermuda petrel, which is not a, I mean, which I haven't even seen. I've missed it twice by one day, which I'm still sort of angry about. But um, yeah, black cat petrel tends not to come to shore. And uh, the storm petrels, not the band rumped, Wilson's maybe. But um, I mean, you can, 
but I, I can't guarantee it like you would if you got uh, out on the boat on the water. Roseanne says, great presentation. I have wonderful memories of my many pelagics during my pre-children days. <laughs> yes. Uh, Nona, did you have a question? Oh, yeah, <laughs> I do. Um, well, great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I just have a question um, to clear up. Uh, I just finished reading a um, David Allen Sibley book. And it was talking about that uh, the gland in the forehead of the seabirds yeah. excreting the salt uh, out of the tubes. And I thought you said something about the glands being inside the mouth. Oh no, no, I I, I may have misspoke. I apologize for that. But yeah, they I are kind of in the, it might around not the mouth, around mind. the bill. Yeah, um, kind of up. Yeah, in that general vicinity. <laughs> okay, because I had just uh, read about the gland being in the forehead. Okay. Any other questions? So Nate, you said the best time of the uh, year would be to go in May. Um, yeah, late, late May, early June tends to be the time for the most diversity of species uh, offshore, because as I said, it, it does kind of catch all of the, it catch, catches the Arctic nesters before they have completely left, uh, catches those, and it catches the um, Southern hemisphere nesters as they're coming in. So you start to get a real nice mix um, by June, July, um, you're not getting as many species, but there's still a lot of good stuff out there. It's hard to pick up numbers. So they, so a lot of the, the summer breeding birds will kind of congregate in bigger numbers. So you, you start to see more Wilson storm petrels, more great shearwater, more quarry shearwater, things Excuse like me. that. Do they plan, does the pandemic have any impact on these tours, the boat tours? That was uh, Brian. Question. Yeah, good question. Brian did run a few. He didn't run as many of them as he did. Um, and he cut the number of people on the boat in half. So there's half as many people on the boat. So everyone has space and um, didn't allow people to go in the cabin. So everyone was sort of outdoors for the whole time. So it was a little more uh, rustic, <laughs> but uh, they, were, they, still, they still got out offshore. Um, you know, although everyone's wearing masks and all that stuff, so so they 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 keep that pretty safe. But um, yeah, fewer fewer people. I think he's looking forward to getting a, a full complement of people out on the boat soon. That'd be great if everybody lot. we could do that. Vivian Anderson asks, are there any goals with a salt salt excreting gland? I don't believe so. I know there are some goals that are more pelagic than others. Things like uh, Savin's goal um, is kind of the 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 pelagic goal, the most pelagic goal. Uh, but I do not believe that it has the, it could be wrong, but I do not believe it has the gland that the tube noses have that allows it to um, drink seawater. They probably get their, um, the water that they need from the food that they eat. So things like the fish that they eat and the, and the small crustaceans that they're picking off the water. Um, uh, Katie wants to know from where do the tours go to sea? Uh, out of Hatteras, North Carolina which is uh, kind of on the, if you're looking at the Outer Banks, maybe it's more like this. <laughs> you? Vogue. It's, uh, yeah, like that. Anyway, it's on the little corner where the Outer Banks like cut back to the mm -hmm. Southwest. Uh, Hatteras is on the corner. And um, yeah, the, the boats go out of there. There's, it's, it's, you know, it's a real popular tourist destination um, just because the beaches are, are real nice there and kind of secluded, a little bit more secluded. So these little towns up all up and down the, uh, the Outer Banks. Um, it's not super easy to get to. <laughs> it's always a pain to to drive for me to to like get because you like you get to the Outer Banks at Nags Head and then you've got like another hour to drive south to get to Hatteras. But um, it's worth it if you can get down there. It it is the closest to the it is the closest to the shelf break of any place on the Eastern Seaboard, and that you'll spend less time motoring out to where the birds are and more time where the birds are, which is one of the selling points. And Katie it wants to know the name of the boat tour or boat tour company. I suppose you can uh, find, find them on, online. Yeah, it's Seabirding. Uh, Brian Patterson, he's a friend of mine. Uh, he's been doing trips out there for, for decades now. He, he knows it. Most of the year, he's a, a fishing charter, uh, but he does cater specific. He's a birder, too, and a photographer, and he does cater specifically to birders on these trips, um, though he does do you know regular fishing tours the rest of the year. And it sounds like a he's miserable gotta, job. Gotta, gotta pay his bills. <laughs> yeah. All yeah. right. Yes, Mike. I have a question. It has to do with uh, climate change. I read a story today 
I guess because of the warming, uh, the icebergs coming off of uh, Iceland, Greenland coming down, yeah. there's less of them. This is going to have a huge temperature change. And there's, I guess, a risk at this point is they're not thinking this is going to happen, but there's a chance that the whole Gulf Stream could be totally changed in a, in a drastic yeah. way. What, what do you know about that? Or I mean, it's all this giant science experiment that we are unwittingly in the middle of. <laughs> like, we don't really know what's what could happen, what what is happening. Um, I do know that the Gulf Stream is getting a little harder to find in recent years uh, because, I, you know, I showed you that map of the surface temperature, of the sea surface temperature, and the Gulf Stream is that really strong red current that goes right through the middle. Well, in recent years, it's been a little more difficult because the water and the sound gets very warm too. And then it kind of bleeds into the Gulf Stream. And so it's kind of harder to find that edge that we're looking for when we're going out looking for birds. Um, so that's been some, you know, that's been something that's happened. Um, but as far as, you know, what it's going to do for the birds, it's, it's like, we, had, we have no idea. Um, you know, the, the, the optimist in me says that these birds are good at finding places where they can eat um, wherever they are on the ocean. Like that is what they are, you know, adapted to do. Um, but, you know, and the problem obviously would be is if, you know, the Gulf Stream off of Hatteras is no longer that place and it makes it much harder for us to find them and enjoy them. So, um, yeah, it's, as I said, it's, it's, a, it's a big mystery box that uh, no one really wants to look inside, but I think we're going to have to. <laughs> All right. Well, it's 8.45. Uh, one last comment. Uh, Nona says, check Cornell for gulls uh, and salt glands. And that's something I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to uh, send you off in the night uh, with a big thank you, Nate. Uh, Nate um, do me a favor, though. Send me uh, your um, home address so we can send you an honorarium. Super. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, Wing gulls had the salt secreting gland. Glaucus winged gulls oh, really? had the salt secreting glands. Yeah. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. I learned something every day. <laughs> I think good. I did a senior paper on that as a as an undergrad. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Nick. And our speaker next month is Daryl Lawson, who is a member of the Petoskey Regional. Audubon Society. He's going to be doing, we went from the Gulf Stream ne next month. We're going to be going to Alaska. So we look forward to seeing you on April 19th. And if you uh, hear screaming uh, tonight, that'll be me because I'm about to turn on the Michigan Minnesota hockey game. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. So much. Thank you.